Hello and welcome to the session, deep dive session on interoperability uh, of CBDCs. Uh, first, we have to say this is the last session of today. And um, after this session, the conference for today will be over, but you will um, have uh, the, the conference will start next today. Um, uh, I mean, tomorrow, sorry. Uh, so why am I here? That's the first question. My name is Vipin Bharatan. I'm here because I am the vice chair of the interoperability working group in DCGI and policy and governance working group. And our, I am the vice chair and it's, part of the policy and governance, like I said, and our ultimate aim is to come up with recommendations for standards as a group. So what does that mean? It means uh, we marry the existing practice to the new and exciting world of uh, digital currencies. And in the interoperability working group, uh, we deal with uh, all kinds of digital currencies, including um, stable coins, cryptocurrencies, and of course, CBDCs and e-money. This session is about CBDCs and in particular about the interoperability of CBDCs. Um, and in our group, we are putting together a document that addresses interoperability from various viewpoints or perspectives, and also address, looks at emerging solutions and standards. And then finally, we would like to produce recommendations for standards. And this uh, particular session is focused on interoperability of CBDCs. And hopefully the end of the session, we'll have an idea of what to address in standards as far as uh, CBDC interoperability is concerned. Um, so why is interoperability needed? Because there are multiple uh, digital currency systems. That is the main reason. Um, and how are we going to address it? There are standards for digital currency identifiers, standards for identifiers for people and enterprises, standards for tokens. These are just technical standards, but here we'll also be addressing some of the policy and regulations um, viewpoints as well, and how can those be incorporated into standards. First, we start off with, uh, you know, I have to address this important question. Why do we need uh, CBDCs? Are they a solution in search of a problem? Uh, which is what many people say, but CBDCs are the central bank liability with very low credit and settlement risk. And they should, um, it should be obvious to most that this is a very necessary uh, instrument that central banks have to put out, although there is pushback from various uh, corners to this uh, enterprise. Um, anyway, thankfully I'm joined here by a able set of people, Tommaso Mancini Grifoli, Daniel Aiden, Saule Omarova and David Mills. Uh, these are all, you can read the, of their achievements and their uh, positions in the, in the presentation slide that you no doubt uh, seen before. So my job is to just introduce the panelists one by one, and then we'll have a Q and A session and then a wrap up. So the first person that is going to present is Tommaso Mancini Grifoli, Division Chief of Monetary Capital Markets at IMF. So let me introduce Tommaso 
please uh, unmute yourself and start your presentation. I will disappear into the background. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very nice um, introduction that lays out uh, a very important uh, work plan. And uh, we're here to speak about interoperability of CBDCs, um, technical standards, um, the plumbing that we can establish between countries to make this work. <clears throat> but I'd like to take a step back and say, that's all very important. But we should not lose track of the macrofinancial implications of making CBDCs interoperable between countries. And that's really what my presentation will be about. I'll speak very briefly. I'll put up a couple of slides um, as backup and try to convince you that it's equally important to take into account these bigger policy issues. So here are my slides which I hope you can see. Um, open economy, CBDC. So of course, when we think about uh, CBDCs, we um, perceive a potential advantage to improve cross-border. If CBDCs were entirely interoperable between borders, uh, there may be fewer intermediaries involved. Maybe I can receive your CBDC directly or we can exchange our CBDCs uh, so that I can make a, a payment abroad. There may be greater competition because of that and greater transparency, the ability to monitor uh, transactions um, for AML CFT purposes, for instance. There's the possibility to establish from the get-go common standards to facilitate these transactions because we're starting with a clean slate in a sense, new rails um, that are promising. And because of the technology, these transactions may be safer and more respectful of financial integrity. Moreover, uh, because computers never sleep, uh, or most at least never sleep, uh, there could be 24 seven transactions around the world. Now, that is a very attractive, those are very attractive prospects and potentially the interoperability of CBDCs could lead to cheaper, faster, more transparent, and more accessible cross-border payments. And of course, there is a G20 roadmap that lays out uh, various steps to improve cross-border payments, one of which is making CBDCs interoperable. And uh, several of us on this panel are part of that work. Now, of course, making CBDC interoperable raises important design and technical challenges. And this is what, of course, this uh, ITU group is working on. Think about, just to illustrate very simply, um, two dimensions of this very complex problem. Uh, will CBDCs be exchanged directly? Will I be able to directly own uh, the foreign CBDC? This was the direct ownership model. Or will I have to trade CBDCs through intermediaries? And are we talking about retail or wholesale CBDCs? Just these two dimensions make a very complex, raise a very complex set of questions. What are the technical standards needed? Uh, how to satisfy AML CFT on both sides? Um, how to design markets where we can exchange CBDCs? How to ensure that this market has sufficient liquidity? Um, how to gather data and um, information and how to share that information across borders in order to satisfy requirements uh, for integrity, but also uh, different requirements for privacy. Uh, what is the role of central banks in uh, this exchange and this intermediation of CBCs across borders and so on and so on. And I know that some of the other panelists will speak about some of these topics. What I'd like to speak about is more of the macrofinancial challenges that need to be addressed. You see, by making CBCs available across borders, by basically taking an eraser and removing many of the frictions currently exist in cross-border payments, we may get much larger gross capital flows between countries, more leverage, um, and thus bigger valuation changes uh, due to exchange rate movements, for instance. And we know that Maury Opsfeld has spoken uh, very clearly about this. We know that uh, large gross uh, positions um, can be unsettling for countries. Um, the second question is, 
capital flow management measures. These are uh, um, uh, controls that countries use to manage their capital flows. Most countries around the world have some form of capital flow management measure in place. About 80% of IMF member countries. So with the existence of CBDCs and their ability to trade, to be traded across borders, circumvent some of these the capital flow measures? Question mark. But if so, this has important implications for countries' macroeconomic policies. The question of currency substitution is also a very important one. That is, <clears throat> will my citizens in my country start to use your CBDC, the foreign CBDC, to store value and potentially to transact. Of course, this is a, a grave uh, problem because the greater currency substitution would imply loss of monetary policy control um, and potentially of foreign exchange interventions. Uh, the effectiveness of foreign exchange interventions would undermine central banks' ability to serve as a lender of last resort would potentially lead to faster transmission of global uh, conditions or financial shocks across countries, and could lead to a loss of information for countries and the loss of tax revenue if the foreign CBDC is used for domestic transactions. So what I'm trying to do is, is emphasize the importance of these um, uh, uh, policy considerations. The existence of the, the trading of seamless trading of CBDCs across borders could also potentially change the configuration of reserve currencies. Although we believe in general, these transformations are relatively slow moving because they also depend on uh, various institutional features, the depth of markets, the credibility of institutions uh, and of legal systems, et cetera. Nevertheless, if these currency configurations change, there would be the need to revisit the uh, types of backstops that we currently have uh, for the international monetary systems of which the IMF is a part. And the very important problem of payment system fragmentation comes up. Are we going to live in a world where there are gonna be clubs of countries where CBDCs can be exchanged seamlessly among them but not between them? That would be uh, uh, an important a problem. And of course, the question of the digital divide. Are we gonna live in a world where some will be able to have CBDCs access CBDCs, trade CBDCs, and live in a very efficient world, and some will not because they will not, they don't simply don't have the technical capacity to do so. And that's an important policy consideration as well. Let me illustrate a little bit some, some um, features of currency substitution so that you, you see how important this is. This is a graph that shows the number of countries, these bars, no, it shows the number of countries um, whose uh, foreign currency deposits in blue, foreign currency deposits um, as a share of total bank deposits are between zero and 10, the first column, 10 and 30, second set of figures, 30 and 50 and 50 and 100% of bank deposits. And in gray, it's the foreign currency loans as a share of bank deposits. Now you can see that there are 27 countries with foreign currency deposits um, uh, 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 between 50 and 100% of total bank deposits around the world and 17 countries um, with foreign, foreign currency loans um, that are between 50 and 100% of total bank loans. Currency substitution is currently already an issue and these countries suffer in terms of their um, independence of policy. This is, uh, um, it goes into a bit more details and shows the countries that indeed have very high levels of currency substitution. And you can see that, that there are plenty of countries with levels uh, above 50%. And this is a slide that shows you the evolution of currency substitution over time. So the dots represent countries and their level of currency substitution after a time T when you started to see an increase in currency substitution. And basically what you see is this black line shows the average across time, it's pretty flat. What does that suggest? It suggests that currency substitution is persistent. And thus there is a, a trade-off here. Um, even if countries see CBDCs coming and improve their policies uh, to try to 
uh, limit the currency substitution. It will take time for policies to improve and for credibility to be built domestic. But the availability of foreign CBDCs could move very fast. And if it does, um, currency substitution could increase in the short term and remain high. It's really hard to fight against currency substitution once it's instilled in a country. So this is an important policy problem uh, to solve. And in fact, we can think about two forms of substitution, really. We can think about rapid substitution and slower substitution. We can think about runs and shifts. So what does these look like? Well, a, a run is really a form of currency substitution and adoption of the foreign currency over a very short period of time. So this is in a country uh, facing a crisis, uh, capital flight, uh, capital flow volatility, and potentially the, the ineffectiveness of capital flow management measures in these cases, um, CBDCs, uh, the readily available uh, foreign currencies in the form of CBDCs, the ability to hold them at lower cost and hold them safely uh, might make runs uh, to foreign currencies more frequent and um, um, more destabilizing. In terms of shifts, we could imagine here a slow movement towards a foreign CBDC. This is really the classical example of currency substitution where countries lose monetary policy under last resort efficiency. And you start to see balance sheet risks building up as um, citizens are exposed to the foreign currency. So when we speak about the currency substitution, we can have these two ideas in mind. And how do we solve this? Well, on the demand side, clearly, uh, the better policies to instill greater confidence and credibility in domestic policies, uh, potentially capital flow management measures to limit the extent to which uh, country, uh, citizens can hold foreign CBCs. But we said that there was a question mark about the effectiveness of these policies. And on the supply side, of course, we could imagine banks uh, issuing CBDCs, allowing for their um, the holdings of their CBDCs to be limited abroad. And I think what these design, um, what these measures really boil down to are two questions. And I'll end with this. The first is, can central banks really control who holds their CBDC? Is it possible? Of course, there can be many criteria on which to decide um, uh, who holds CBDCs, one of them being, citizenship or geographical uh, location. But can they do it? Is it technically uh, possible? Is it legally possible? Are there constraints? Uh, what about shell accounts that people can hold, uh, people can open through uh, a foreign corporation, for instance? And what about synthetic CBDCs? We've written about this, and this is the idea that uh, there can be a private issuer of digital money that takes your domestic CBDC and issues a, uh, its own liability in exchange one for one. So you're holding something that is just the safe uh, given a certain regulatory and legal structure, but you're holding something that the central bank may be able to control much less because then you're trading over the private network as opposed to over the public CBDC network. And those um, types of digital monies could spill over across borders much more easily. So the question remains, can central banks really control who holds their CBDCs? And I'll be very interested to hear what panelists have to say. And the second is, will central banks, will all central banks want to control who holds their CBDC? And we can think about, you know, central banks that decide to cooperate and central banks that decide not to cooperate. And I think the cooperation example is really central banks allowing foreign governments to set certain limits um, uh, on the wallets that are used by foreign citizens to hold CBDC. Suppose you issue CBDC and you, you um, allow certain parameters of wallets to be managed by a foreign government so that the foreign government can decide to set a, a limit on balances, on daily transactions, or, or whatever else. That's the cooperation example. And the non-cooperation example, the question is what, is, what can countries do? And uh, is perhaps the only uh, possibility to work with exchanges where, that are used to convert domestic currency into the foreign CBDC um, and to um, 
to, to establish certain controls at the level of the exchanges? These are open questions. These are completely open questions that I wanted to pose uh, to the group uh, to have a discussion. Um, I don't have strong views on this, but this is really just to stimulate discussion. But clearly, these are important uh, questions. And I, what I tried to suggest in this presentation is that the policy implications are very serious, so we should be thinking quite hard about these questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. We will be um, talking about some of these uh, during the Q&A, but right now we're going to have Daniel Iden come up and talk about his view or his experience as the advisor to BIS uh, Innovation Hub in Hong Kong. They have uh, come up with a couple of very interesting projects that are POCs, but still uh, may answer many of your questions. So Daniel is going to present next. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Vipin. I'm, I'm not sure I'll be able to answer Tomas's questions, uh, but I'll, I'll do my best to, to add value. Uh, it's, a, it's always a, always a tough act to follow, and I always learn new things whenever I listen to any of Tomas's presentations, so thank you. Thank you for having me. I'll just quickly share my screen and get started here uh, right away. Right, so today we're going to talk about interoperability for cross-border payments and CBDC. Um, the agenda that I have ready for us today is in five quick bullet points. I want to talk about the motivation, which may be a little bit um, redundant, uh, considering that uh, everybody is here for the probably for good reasons. Um, I like to, number two, I'll start with, I'll talk about some definitions of interoperability uh, from a BIS perspective. I'll highlight four quick models for cross-border CBDC interoperability, and then I'll end with a BIS Innovation Hub overview of some of our cross-border solutions, and uh, I'll conclude uh, with some final remarks, okay? So um, getting started on the motivation, um, I, I think it's clear when we think about the correspondent banking network and the reality of cross-border payments today that uh, much work is necessary. I was glad to hear Tommaso mention the G G20 cross-border roadmap, um, and that is very much kind of the, the focal point of a lot of the initiatives that are going on around the world. Um, when you look at the image on the left-hand side, this is a schematic diagram of how uh, we see uh, correspondent banking networks. You can look at the colored circles around the perimeters as different jurisdictions, and essentially, if one node on one side wants to talk to another node on another side, it needs to do through, so through a routing of different correspondent banks. Some of those paths could be shorter. Some of them can be longer. It really depends on the nature of those relationships. In general, these processes are costly, complex, have high effects settlement risk, low transparency, and have a lot of reconciliation and reporting. Um, you can see a breakdown uh, based on a McKinsey study on the right-hand side of if you take 100% of the cost of the payment, not the payment itself, but the cost, it can be broken down into those subcategories of cost. So you can see the top four being nostro vostro liquidity, treasury operations, FX cost, and, compliant, and compliance costs. So as you pay, as the value and volume of the correspondent network goes up, that margin gets smaller, and ultimately the ones that suffer most are actually remittance payments and small value um, payments in general. I think an interesting component of this that doesn't get talked about a lot um, is the value of active correspondent banks and the strength of these relationships as a prerequisite to um, cross-border payments at large. What you have in front of you is a graph that shows the state of active correspondent banks um, with respect to both value and active correspondent relationships in general. What I'd like to just contrast is if you look at the yellow um, circles, those are active correspondent and value both increasing, which means there are more active correspondent relationships over the course of time being created in that region and the value being transmitted on those channels is going up over time as well. And of course, you can see that that is by far the minority of the world map. 
in contrast to that, in gray, you can see the areas where the active correspondent number of relationships is decreasing and the value is increasing, or underneath it, active correspondence is decreasing and the value is decreasing as well. So the majority of the world would fall into a scenario where either the active correspondence are decreasing or the value is decreasing as well, which really talks about a steady decline in the health of active correspondent relationships of, of correspondent banking uh, at large. So when we think about inclusion and we think about it as inclusion of the individual, I think what this work uh, shows is that financial inclusion can also happen uh, at a country and jurisdiction level. Um, to, to deal with some of this, um, this is the, uh, the G20 stage two roadmap. Um, it's broken up into five building blocks, uh, the building blocks from A to E, and I won't enumerate through all of them, um, but I will say that we, we at the BIS focus primarily on um, building block E. Now each of the, the building block E being new payments, new payment infrastructures and arrangements. If I kind of double clicked on this circle, and, and highlighted every building block that's contained within them. You have a total of 19 building blocks. And I think the building blocks, there's a lot of great work here. And you can see that when we talk about technical interoperability, a lot of these don't just fall into technical interoperability. There's a lot of other types of interoperability and we'll get to that definition in a moment. But I'd like to just, um, I'd like to just pull your attention um, to uh, building block E, looking at those three last um, uh, subsections. So consider the feasibility of new multilateral platforms and arrangements for cross-border payments, foster the soundness of global stablecoin arrangements, and factor an international dimension into CBDC design, which I think is very much kind of the core of what we're discussing today. Um, to maybe preempt the solution a little bit, CBDCs could simplify the monetary architecture and substantially streamline the cross-border payment chain. What you see at the top uh, is today's, roughly speaking, correspondent arrangement. So if we took from the diagram before and kind of actually drew out a transaction, that's what it would look like. You can see between the payer and the payee, you have diff multiple different banks with an effects market in between. And the promise of CBDC cross-border arrangements, or as we call them, multi-CBDC arrangements, is having an effects provider somewhere in the middle, but ultimately two CBDC payment system providers, payment service providers that could connect to each other in a, in a seamless way, ultimately creating um, a lot of the benefits that Tomaso articulated in the previous uh, presentation uh, for cross-border payments. So let's talk about some definitions really quickly. Um, and um, let's talk about attributes of interoperability. So we like to break interoperability up into these three sections business, semantic, and technical interoperability, okay? So when we think about business interoperability, we wanna think about um, systems that agree on kind of the premise of, of the context, right? So uh, how to settle obligations, how to connect payment systems, how to address the risk of failure, things that you think about as sitting outside of the system itself. Then there's the semantic layer. So you can think about that as, uh, understanding the same language and interpreting the same messaging structure. And then last but not least, underneath, you have the technical platform. Uh, so, so things around technical standards, messaging, data, uh, hardware, things like that. I think the example that brings this to life is, um, you know, this conference call right here. So if we maybe took that backwards, uh, let's start from the technical. We have technical interoperability because we are all on this Teams invite, I think, or it might be a WebEx. Um, whatever architecture we're running underneath it doesn't matter if you're on a Mac or on a PC or if or 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 if you're on your iPad. It, it doesn't matter. We have technical interoperability. My video stream is coming through. You can hear my voice. You can see my face. Um, that that's working. That wasn't always the case. I should maybe remind people that there used to be a time where you couldn't take a file from a Mac computer and put it on Windows and and open it. So technical interoperability is not given. Semantic interoperability is the fact that we are all here talking about the same topic. We're talking in English. We understand each other. Business interoperability is the use cases we're talking about, cross-border payments, the fact that you're all on mute, 
and I'm not, and there's a QA, and a and so on and so forth. So those are the layers of interoperability in this call, and it very, works very similar for, for technical systems and interoperability of pins. I'll move along now to quickly talk about some of the form models that we see for cross-border payments. Um, so reading clockwise, single access point, bilateral links, hub and spoke, and um, cloud, uh, sorry, a common platform. So those form models vary slightly um, in terms of their um, advantages and disadvantages and challenges. Um, maybe just to give a couple of, of examples to bring these to life, when we think about an, a single access point system, that would be the equivalent of jurisdiction, the difference between jurisdiction A and jurisdiction B being completely separate, but you have a single link, a single access point, a single correspondent, if you may, that actually has a, a, a foot in both systems that enables through a single access point integration between those two systems. A bilateral link would be taking two payment systems and asking them to speak directly to each other. Um, the, this uh, is relatively straightforward. The issue with this is that it doesn't scale very well. So you can imagine a system of bilateral links once you multiply it by two, by four, by eight, by 16, the number of links that you need to do to um, to facilitate a bilateral system grows exponentially with the number of systems you're connecting. Um, sorry, going down to the left-hand side, so not the clockwise, but down to the hub and spoke model. Um, a, a hub and spoke model would be multiple systems that ultimately, ultimately integrate into a hub, and that hub allows settlement and finality within that context. This actually solves the problem of the bilateral linking, but introduces um, some other issues around connectivity of the hub, um, scaling issues, what that hub looks like, uh, and things like that. And I'll, I'll try to bring these to life a little bit when I talk about some of our project work. Last but not least, you have a common platform. This is probably by far the most complex to implement in its own right, but the common platform is really all jurisdictions get together and perform and, and, and cooperate on a common settlement infrastructure. Um, so um, you alleviate this, the, the bilateral problem and to some degree the hub and spoke problem, uh, but the common platform is the hardest to build um, and maintenance of this type of platform and governance of this type of platform is, is by far seemingly the most complex. So to maybe make these things a little bit more tangible and bring these to life a little bit, um, I'll talk a little bit about the BIS Innovation Hub and try to show some examples of these type of models in our current work. So maybe just to st stand back a little bit, if people here haven't heard of the BIS Innovation Hub. Um, so our, our three main objectives are to identify critical trends in technology, to develop public goods uh, using those critical trends, and to facilitate a network of central bank experts on innovation. We have a global footprint. What you can see here is our three existing centers. Uh, we have one in Basel, we have one in Singapore, and we have one in Hong Kong, where I'm calling you from. Um, we've recently opened new centers in Toronto, London, Stockholm, and our European center in Frankfurt and in Paris. We have a strategic partnership with the New York Fed, uh, and we have business in, uh, BIS Innovation Network working group chairs all over the world, as you can see. So we definitely straddle uh, the entire globe. This is our work program from last year, and the only reason I'm showing this is to show that in spite of us talking here about CBDC, when we think about the innovation agenda at large, it's, a, it's much broader than just CBDC. Uh, supervisory tech and regulatory tech, next generation FMIs, open finance, cybersecurity, green finance, those are all on the agenda. Um, you, you see the three existing centers here, but actually our work program was announced today for the following year. And in that work program, we have all seven centers and it's a much more elaborate view of the next year. So if you wanna see what we're up to, I, I highly recommend checking this out. So I wanted to highlight just in, in, in the closing remarks, maybe in the last two minutes, I hope I'm not going over, over time. Uh, if I am, um, please ping me Vipin or jump, jump in because I can't seem to see the chat. Um, I just wanted to highlight some of our work and maybe bring to life some of some of uh, the, the previous models that we were talking about. So the four projects I selected in order are, are Project Embridge, uh, Project Jura. Are we good, Vipin? Do I have a couple more minutes? Yeah, that looked like it. Yes. Um, yeah, please uh, close it out uh, okay. because I, I think everybody is going over a little bit, but that's okay. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, I apologize. I, I as as I was preparing the slides, I saw this is a little bit long. So Project Enbridge, Project Jura, Project Dunbar, and Project Nexus. And maybe the only thing I'll say about this is that Project Enbridge. Uh, so so Project Enbridge has four regions in it: uh, HKMA, PBOC, uh, Bank of Thailand, and CBUAE. Um, Project Dunbar also has four regions in it. It's led by the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Project Jura is between um, uh, the uh, the Swiss National Bank and the Banque de France, and Project Nexus is also a, a, a MAS initiative. All, th all, th all three of the first projects are CBDC cross-border projects in different regions focusing on a single common platform. Project Nexus is connectivity of a hub and spoke model for retail payments. The first three are all uh, wholesale. Nexus is a retail project. So within the scope of these projects, we're covering multiple of these different uh, interoperability models. If time was permitting, I would have loved to, to jump into some of the architecture of Jura to talk about interoperability at a systems level. Um, this is a great example, and I would encourage anybody that's interested in this to, to read uh, the, the, the project um, and to see some of the interesting technology that was implemented there to facilitate cross-network transfer of assets between the SIC system in Switzerland and Target 2 system uh, in France. And I'll end uh, with a wonderful, wonderful speech that was given by Mr. Augustin Carsons, our general manager. Uh, and I'll, I'll just read the very top. At the, core of, at the core of the system are central banks. They act as operators, overseers, and catalysts in the payment market and regulate and supervise private providers of the public, of the public interest. Working together, they can provide central bank digital currencies, like private stablecoins, CBDC do not need to borrow their credibility from sovereign currencies. They inherit their trust. The public already places in the currency. They can thus serve as a sound foundation for future innovation. Um, and with that, we'll pass it back to you, Vipin. Uh, and thanks for having me. Thank you. It's a wonderful thing to hear about all the projects that BIS is involved in. Uh, so we heard the monetary policy angle. We heard sort of a, a technical uh, view of those monetary policy uh, projects. Now we're gonna hear from a Sole, who's Omarova, Professor Omarova is an expert in regulation and we have to uh, listen to her to see what the legal and regulatory demands are going to be on such interoperability systems, she could be just asking important questions, but those questions have to be answered in order for us to proceed in a fruitful manner that is different from the past. So please, Saule, take over and do your thing. Well, thank you so much, Vipin, uh, for inviting me to um, present uh, my thoughts at this uh, illustrious panel. It is a tough act to follow, both Tommaso and Daniel. And um, I would like to sort of um, continue on the same path of the discussion that Tommaso and Daniel began, by perhaps um, picking up on this sort of the three layer, three dimensions of interoperability that Daniel mentioned, uh, business, semantic, technical, um, and focus us a little bit on the importance of uh, the fourth layer. Uh, and perhaps it's not even a layer, but the general environment in which those layers of interoperability exist. And I would call it tentatively governance uh, layer or perhaps public policy interoperability layer. So um, just to step back and think about what, what that really means. So cross-border CBDC interoperability, what is it? Well, ultimately, conceptually, it's a form of structural integration. In other words, to pick up on that metaphor that Tomaso used, taking the eraser and erasing certain boundaries, integrating the space. And the questions that we need to ask ourselves as a community participating in that exercise of erasing boundaries is, first of all, um, how much can we achieve of this type of structural integration? But behind that, there is a bigger issue is, uh, you know, how much of such structural integration 
do we really want? And that's when the public policy and regulatory interoperability, if you will, of different CBDC efforts comes into play particularly strongly. So the goal of interoperability um, is, of course, to create a seamless transactional flow, not just the flow of payments, but also the flow of investments and financial products, non-financial goods and services. In other words, the structural integration is ideally much bigger than sim uh, simply the integration of the payments. Um, and interoperability would achieve that by eliminating certain transactional frictions. Right. In other words, um, increasing the speed of payments, um, transfers and transactions, uh, increasing the access, convenience, um, transparency and predictability, cost savings uh, will be higher, supposedly increasing volumes and capacity. And that's basically what uh, what we all know. That's um, that is the potential benefits of interoperable CBDCs and creating that uh, world of integration. There are three key tools that we have in that uh, exercise. Uh, one is technology. Uh, then there are institutional arrangements, market uh, structures, but also institutional arrangements in terms of uh, oversight. And finally, there is a uh, kind of legal and regulatory uh, arrangements, the structure that would, uh, that would be interacting with technology and institutions. So with respect to designing interoperability in the CDC, CBDC world, uh, technology on the one hand and institutional and legal arrangements on the other hand uh, are interacting in a particularly complex way. So for example, technology. Technology is an external catalyst of change. That's sort of the source of the innovation, right? That's the disruptive factor in a way it is something that kind of comes from the outside uh, and sort of creates that possibility for producing those transactional efficiencies that we all associate with interoperable CBDCs. Legal and institutional arrangements, on the other hand, are much more path dependent just by nature. And in that sense, uh, they are more of a legacy uh, factor. And so when we are talking about clean slate, as uh, one of the potential benefits that CBDCs offer with respect to reorganizing the payments flow in the world, we have to be aware of that sort of legacy um, significance when it comes to the legal institutional arrangements. Um, the role of legal institutional arrangements uh, with respect to interoperable CBDCs is to support those transactional efficiencies, the speed, the access, convenience, the cost savings and so on and so forth. But it's a little bit more than that because the goal and the role of the legal institutional arrangements is also to control and reduce the systemic risks uh, or that, uh, that those same transactional efficiencies generate and to integrate technology and public policy seamlessly together. That integration is done through uh, structuring the institutions surrounding uh, CBDCs, uh, particularly on the global level, and rules and, uh, and the policy um, that those rules represent. So um, this is already kind of a common place to say that uh, transactional efficiency is the speed, the access, and so on and so forth, can create problems on a macro level. And Tommaso um, brilliantly uh, kind of highlighted for us some of those macro financial risks and challenges that interoperability creates. But what I would like to kind of uh, highlight in that respect, maybe to add to Tommaso's um, discussion, is to show how those types of macro financial challenges also have a layer of special challenges from the perspective of regulatory capacity. In other words, Central banks that uh, start living in that interoperable world of CBDCs, their tasks, their existing tasks and the new tasks become incredibly complex in a qualitatively, in a qualitatively different way, new way. So for example, the fact that the aggregate transactional volumes uh, increase, uh, the gross flows uh, of payments, not only money, but also uh, the flow of um, 
investments and financial interactions and so on and so forth increase, that scale makes it much more difficult for central banks to control or even monitor uh, the, not only the flows, but the impact of those flows on their domestic systems and their domestic policy goals. The speed of interaction in the financial system and payment system also, of course, increases speculative trading in uh, financial markets, for example, and potential leverage uh, accumulations and uh, the configurations in which leverage exists. So to the extent that central banks want to keep an eye on uh, the impact of um, speculation and um, you know, trading and uh, leverage on their internal sort of systems, that becomes much more complex. Of course, the speed also increases the speed of contagion and the multiplicity of channels through which that contagion uh, of various risks can, can um, happen. Um, interestingly, also, large private firms, uh, particularly tech firms, may exert um, outsized de facto control uh, of payments and the financial infrastructures through which those payments flow. And that raises the question, who operates the rails through which that interoperable CBDC um, actually becomes interoperable? But even more importantly, there is an interesting question that I find fascinating is uh, the lender of last resort, right? And Tommaso kind of mentioned that issue. So um, the lender of last resort and other liquidity backup provisions may need to be activated uh, very quickly, in fact, in real time and on a much larger scale in the world of interoperable CBDCs. And that creates a governance issue, a governance conundrum that brings together technology, law, institutions, both on the international and the domestic level. So for example, in particularly in times of market turbulence, right? Who, which central bank really um, should step in and take that uh, lender of last resort uh, role on itself, upon itself? Should there be an agreement? And if there should be an agreement with respect to allocating these responsibilities and powers in effect among central banks, um, then that agreement should be uh, achieved before the world becomes interoperable, possibly? Or should the goal be to render that role uh, less relevant, or perhaps even irrelevant, through purely technical controls, right? And that's the question that ultimately goes to the issue of access. Can central banks control access to their CBDCs? And that is a technical question, but perhaps it's also a policy question. For example, domestically, the CBDC can be designed in a way that you know, a particular central bank can decide which entities can have access to its own balance sheet and to its own liquidity provision on intraday level or on some other basis. Can there be a situation in which a particular central bank can become the effectively an international lender of last resort in certain situations by virtue of its exposure to specific large um, payment service providers. And so if that's the case, um, then how can it be managed? Uh, can it be managed to pure domestic regulation or do we need some kind of a broader international agreement on institutional and legal matters? So the point of this little example is uh, to emphasize how important it is to acknowledge the deeper linkages, um, operational linkages, if you will, between technology and governance. And governance in that sense is as much a policy and regulatory and ultimately perhaps a political issue as it is a technology problem. And a couple of just quick um, uh, finishing thoughts, right? Where does it leave us? If we acknowledge these linkages and start actually digging into these types of things like uh, lender of last resort and liquidity provision, right? Certain institutional access decisions on the domestic level in the CBDC uh, um, experiments and so, so on and so forth. Is it really achievable for us uh, to really aim for interoperability on an international level from the start? Um, perhaps those types of regional, as Tommaso said, I think clubs, right? Or maybe regional CBDC unions um, could be the more achievable, the more realistic sort of uh, sandbox type experiment 
as the first step toward a full interoperability, because it might be easier to manage the governance aspect of this kind of unity, right? With respect to agreeing on substantive legal and normative and regulatory and policy goals and how to um, operate, uh, operationalize those goals. But on the other hand, if we start uh, with the multitude of these types of clubs in terms of interoperable CBDCs, are we going to create a new form of legacy that is going to be very difficult to overcome? In other words, to create a truly seamless transactional space on a larger scale? Uh, or should we actually bite the bullet and admit that in order to create the CBDC world that is interoperable and therefore to increase the value of CBDC even domestically, from the start, we need to really introduce uh, more creative and perhaps bolder thinking about creating an institutional forum or maybe enhancing the existing international institutional fora for deciding on how do we bring together greater interoperability at the level of our laws and normative policy goals and regulatory goals alongside technology and to what extent the two can complement one another and to what extent there are tensions that can only be resolved through negotiation and governance agreements. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sally. Um, so we go from monetary policy um, governance to technical to a super DAO, which is spread out all over the world. And talking about super DAOs, now I'm going to bring in, um, you know, people from the Fed who are probably closest to the super DAO than anybody else. So uh, between the Fed and BBOC, they probably cover um, 60 to 70 percent of the inter uh, uh, sovereign um, market. So. Without further ado, David Mills, who's Associate Director, the Federal Board, and uh, who can also talk about operationalizing some of these uh, issues, some of these problems. He, he knows a lot about uh, payment systems, be, having written about FedNow uh, and other topics, and probably not FedNow, but more on the older system. Uh, but uh, we are going towards Fed now. Maybe it is going to be Fed now for the whole world. I don't know. So, David, please round out our conversation. Thank you, Vipin. And let me just get my screen up here. And hopefully people are able to see that. So, um, so one of the one of the benefits of, of going last, I think, is is uh, being able to to leverage and uh, piggyback off of a lot of the the good thoughts that have been said by uh, the previous three panelists so far. Um, so uh, I'm going to try to take a, a slightly different tact, anticipating that we uh, as uh, we had a lot of policy discussions around some of the policy considerations. Uh, supervisory considerations around uh, achieving interoperability for cross-border payments through C for CBDC, um, and so I'm going to try to try to take from from that big picture into some maybe initial thoughts and reactions uh, to sort of where you know where do we want to think and focus some of the efforts around technology standards, and so that's what that's kind of where I'd I'd like to kind of end us. Uh, today, uh, before opening up for for a broader discussion, and you know, I, I have to say at the outset that uh, these views that that I'm about to express are my own and and not reflective of anyone uh, else at the Board of Governors or the Federal Reserve System overall. So I just want to get that out there. So. <clears throat> um, as, as I think you've heard through other uh, other panelists discussions already and um, but you know also just to, to help level set when we think about design decisions for potential CBDCs right there are a range of things that have to be thought about 
Um, and this is just thinking about what an individual central bank uh, is faced with in terms of thinking a bit about how to build a central bank digital currency. And I've kind of, uh, you know, broad, broken that up into some broad themes, you know, uh, most of with a, with a bit of a technology focus, but not, in, not exclusively. And the first is, you know, just how does one design uh, the characteristics of the CBDC itself. For example, what does CBDC pay interest? You know, what are sort of the technological elements underneath a central bank digital currency? And that's ultimately going to be tied uh, fundamentally to some of the, the motivations or use cases or, or user needs uh, in each jurisdiction uh, that will help determine uh, some of those important uh, design uh, characteristics. The second broad category is the technology underlying architecture. So how is the central bank pretty much going to account for and distribute, um, you know, the, uh, any potential central bank digital currency. So what is the underlying infrastructure, which is going to be important? And I'm here, I'm thinking most primarily, at, at least at the outset of the infrastructure for um, how the central bank interacts with a distribution channel uh, for central bank digital currency. So today, uh, just thinking about traditional legacy payments infrastructures, right, there are uh, uh, you know, FedNow was mentioned as, as one potential uh, new retail instant payments platform. In the U.S., we have uh, FedWire for, for wholesale markets. There's an entire distribution channel that ultimately connects those uh, institutions that have access to that channel to then be able to receive uh, existing forms of central bank money. So, you know, a, a CBDC in and of itself may leverage new or different types of technologies uh, even if it leverages the same types of entities and institutions. Um, so we have to think a bit about what that in infrastructure may look like uh, or range of infrastructures. I shouldn't say that maybe there's there's not one particular infrastructure, but but many. The third group, large category that I'd flag is the, you know, what are the types of entities that would have access to that underlying infrastructure? And so access policy of central banks is fundamental here. Some of those are fixed by statute. Some of those are fixed by laws. and uh, or other other policy uh, po policy actions, but again, thinking about who will uh, be able to access the underlying infrastructure and be able to then ultimately interact with the general public uh, more more directly uh, from that is is going to be an important consideration. Um, the fourth category I have here is the technology then of the infrastructure used to transfer and transact central bank digital currencies. So this is where we kind of talk a bit about. Uh, what are the payments platforms that could be used for a central bank digital currency? Um, and so again, the tech that, that can be a different technology or the same, you know, it's to be determined in, in variety of ways from the technology of the underlying infrastructure, infrastructure where the central bank issues and redeems uh, central bank digital currencies in a variety of forms. And then finally, you know, it's important to think a bit about the ways in which consumers and businesses will interact and be able to interact with a central bank digital currency. So, you know, what are the types of underlying uh, uh, access points, apps, point of sale transactions, integration, uh, again, thinking domestically, uh, the, the different ways in which a CBDC can be accessed and used for transactions purposes is, is also going to be important. Um, Another uh, another sort of layer of technology that's important is how to convert to other forms of the same currency. So central bank digital currency into bank deposits, into physical cash, uh, other ranges that are available uh, today um, under uh, a very strong operating assumption that these other types of, of access points to the currency uh, will will certainly coexist. And that, that, that generally is, is the mindset that um, that the Fed and other central banks um, who have been working on this uh, continue to, to uh, um, assume that even though things like physical currency may decline, uh, it is not necessarily thinking of a central bank digital currency as a replacement for these, but rather as a complement. And so how do we think about technologically how these may e be easily converted uh, to other forms? And then finally, the topic of the day, how to exchange uh, a central bank digital currency for other currencies uh, to make cross-border payments. So um, as, as you know, I think the point of this is to just say that there are a lot of technical design questions, some of which are going to be uh, very domestically oriented, some of which are important and crucial to think about from a cross-border perspective. And so 
we, we have to kind of keep in mind that there are a lot of different technology decisions and other policy and business decisions, as others have talked about, to be contemplating as we think about central bank digital currencies for cross-border. So um, the key for uh, cross-border payments and central bank digital currencies for cross-border payments is how can you effectively and efficiently exchange central bank digital currencies? I think that's fundamental here. Um, you know, we, we note, and, and others in the panel have already noted that uh, people have a vision for central bank digital currencies as a way to address a number of pain points in cross-border payments. Um, you know, on the technology side, I, you know, I've highlighted a few things here that, that others have already highlighted. You know, how do we address fragmented and truncated data formats, uh, messaging platforms? How do we deal with complex processing of compliance checks for illicit financial, you know, prevention and detection of illicit financial activity, which is an important aspect to be thinking about how technology can make that capable. Uh, I think it was brought up earlier by Tommaso about limited operating hours and how you kind of overcome some of the, the frictions of that, thinking about how a central bank digital currency uh, will be able to, to transact in ways in which where the liquidity needs may not be fully accessible on the other end. And how do we think about that? I think uh, so I mentioned a bit about financial stability risk. There's a lot of liquidity needs when you think about cross-border payments. How would those be handled? Uh, and how to sort of simplify long transactions change. I think Daniel talked a bit about the simplicity of alternative forms of bringing together different payments transactions platforms for leveraging uh, central bank digital currency transactions and simplifying the, the different ways in which we could simplify uh, cross-border payments today. So the big question then is, can central bank digital currencies accomplish some of the, you know, reducing these pain points, creating some effectiveness and efficiency uh, that other legacy systems cannot? And of course, we, you know, it was also mentioned earlier that the idea of a clean slate or a greenfield approach um, that, that is certainly worth thinking about. Um, I'm thinking about it uh, for, primarily as a, you know, with the list that I had on the previous slide, that a lot of this gets to the transactions level and a lot of the, I think the, the technical standards and specifications to be thinking about are primarily focused on that payments angle, that cross-border payments angle and those types of platforms to, to think a bit about where standards might be, uh, might be helpful. So on, on my next slide then, so how, how are CBDCs envisioned to help? I mentioned there's a clean slate. There's a way to, to provide uh, platforms that allow for instant settlement, 24 by seven by 365 operations, overcoming some of the basic frictions. Again, it's worth asking whether legacy systems will be able to accomplish a lot of the same things if, if brought together in a similar way. Uh, but, but certainly CBDCs and the fact that we're starting to just think about different ways in which these could be built and envision ways to, uh, that these could be built. How do we keep sort of that cross-border uh, to the technical standards for cross-border in mind as we contemplate decisions around central bank digital currency use and in, in, in operation? Um, and so finally, you know, because of that, we have this opportunity to establish cooperation uh, across jurisdictions. That's going to be fundamentally important. Um, you know, we, we need to kind of identify appropriate clearing and settlement arrangements, agreed upon business rules, market practices, in addition to technical standards. So again, I'm just kind of repeating a bit of what uh, other, other of our panelists uh, have mentioned. So finally, um, you know, maybe what I'd like to leave us with maybe is just a, a parting set of ideas about what would, we, what would the minimum set of technical standards for CBCs be needed to achieve uh, the ability to enhance cross-border payments efficiency and effectiveness. And so, you know, it's not necessarily thinking about technical uh, interoperability across those five categories that I mentioned uh, on the first slide, but really thinking a bit about platforms and payment platforms and the technical standards that will be needed there. I think the other aspects of decision-making are gonna be very jurisdictional in nature. There are gonna be a lot of range of, of approaches domestically on how to design instruments themselves, the types of technologies that they'll be choosing. 
really what we need to think, be thinking about from a standards perspective is how to actually connect those cross border in order to be able to achieve efficiency. And so I would say, you know, my, my thinking here is that we would try to approach this from a technical standards on a limited set of tools and techniques that deal with um, two things in particular. Uh, one is to make sure that uh, we think a bit about technical standards focused on payments and the second on compliance. So for payments, it's really trying to focus on messaging platforms, the way to connect uh, existing systems that are just the systems that might leverage CBDCs jurisdictionally uh, in order to be able to focus on the ease of transactions across multiple platforms. And the second big thing is uh, on standards would be to, again, to enable that broader use case. The one thing that we haven't talked a lot about today is, is how to leverage digital identity standards and digital identity platform frameworks to be thinking a bit about ways in which uh, common sets of standards to be able to, to, to able identify the transactors on either ends of a transaction for compliance rules, which are fundamentally important across jurisdictional uh, tra cross-border transactions and will need to be absolutely addressed. And are there ways to be efficient about that, you know, in, in terms of how to think about the standards uh, related to being able to continue to know your customer, uh, to do your AML checks, uh, to prevent terrorist financing? We need to be thoughtful about ways in which uh, standards can leverage, uh, we can leverage standards here to actually uh, improve compliance, reduce costs and burdens, which are also a big part of some of the pain points in cross-border payments. Uh, so those are my remarks. Uh, uh, so thank you. I'll turn it back over uh, to Vipin. Thank you, uh, David. Yeah, I think we you should all unmute and get uh, unmute, maybe not unmute, but at least get on the um, video because we are going to have a true panel discussion now, which is, uh, you know, a very difficult thing to achieve in a controlled environment because obviously you cannot control people's remarks, but, uh, you know, we are going to uh, talk about certain things. And that is the reason why Vijay uh, wanted those questions asked uh, because, and I'm not going to pose the same question to, the same people, uh, meaning the person who originated the question may not get that question, but somebody else may. Um, so first, first, first of all, uh, thank you all for, you know, a broad view of this whole landscape, which is vast and complex. And of course, we try to swallow it by making it into little bits, uh, little circles somewhere around the globe. And how can that all those little circles joined together to become a big circle, which is what the question that Saule asked. And uh, I think I'm going to start with uh, David because he finished the last. Uh, and he asked a question, which is, um, which I'm posing to him, which is what is uh, the Fed doing about interoperability? Sure. So um, as, as uh, probably many of you know, the Fed Reserve Board uh, in Washington just last week uh, released our discussion paper uh, for central bank digital currencies for the U.S. market. And we pose a, a, a number of questions. Uh, we have a comment period that will go on for uh, about four months. Uh, and we are trying to, again, be thoughtful about range of use cases, why we need, uh, why would the US need a central bank digital currencies? What are some of the elements we need to think about? And then if we were to, to, um, to issue a central bank digital currency, we do want input on design. We put a few markers down uh, on, uh, on what the design principles might look like. Um, again, to further elicit a lot of discussion um, amongst a variety of stakeholders, both public and private. Um, here in the US. And I will say that one core tenant or one core principle that we emphasized was that a central bank digital currency should be transferable. So we avoided the use of the word interoperable because I think interoperability as our discussions here, you know, there's a lot of aspects that go into 
uh, interoperability. There are a lot of different types of definitional ways to think about interoperability, but we want to make sure that we're thinking about a central bank digital currencies that adds to the existing type of uh, ways in which consumers and businesses transact with the dollar today. Um, but and that we that central bank digital currencies could presumably be transferred across multiple platforms. So there's some degree of interoperability or some degree of technical interoperability that will be foundational and important. And we're certainly eliciting comments and feedback from uh, a variety of stakeholders on the achievability and ways to think of it about that. So that's that's the first thing. The second big thing is that we've been working technologically um, you know, to, to, on a number of small scale experiments to think a bit about, again, interoperability across multiple systems. And this includes both new systems that might leverage newer technologies, as well as um, using things that look like legacy systems. So, you know, how can we interact, say, with some uh, a newer type of technology? Maybe it's a permission blockchain. Uh, and how might that intersect with a, a legacy instant payments platform uh, like Fedwire or, you know, to, to come FedNow? And so how do we think a bit about integration there? How do we think a bit about transferability across those platforms? What sort of aspects do we need to think about? There's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, and a lot of work to, to, to be thoughtful about here. But certainly, I think uh, the key areas that we are focused on uh, is is making sure that we are able to communicate any sort of concept of a central bank digital currency across multiple platforms. And so that's uh, that's one of our big areas of focus. Thank you. Um, for the uh, question and answer session, it would be good to uh, be pointed because there are all these, you know, everybody has uh, opinions and thoughts and uh, ideas and views on the question. So the second question is a question like that, which almost everybody has asked, which is how do you reflect or uh, try to bring in the policy consideration into technical standards uh, in uh, you know what capabilities specifically should technical standards have in order to uh, in order to implement not just today's policy questions but also of the future? So, Tommaso, uh, you should uh, start off first, but you should then uh, have each one of us one of you should answer the question because you you are interested in that topic and and that. You know, you ask those that particular question. Thanks very much, <clears throat> Dipin. It's a difficult question because <laughs> today's and tomorrow's policies. But I suppose you know one of the uh, I can I can pick one and talk a little bit about <clears throat> currency substitution, which I brought up as one of the important uh, policy uh, objectives. You know, managing currency substitution. What does that uh, request require? One thing <clears throat> it requires identity. Uh, we uh, must know uh, who is transacting, where they're coming from, if we want to be able to segregate on the basis of nationality, geographical location, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing is uh, perhaps certain standards on um, the parameters that countries wishing to implement certain capital flow management measures. Um, <clears throat> what are the parameters that those countries would want to control? Is it um, total balances held in a uh, wallet of, of foreign currency? Is it um, amount of transactions per day? Um, is it the number of transactions um, in, in one day or the, uh, the location of the people to wh whom the transactions are made? We would want to know what those parameters are uh, and we would want to, to make those very clear so that ideally, in a world of cooperating central banks, which is what I was uh, suggesting before, um, uh, there would be some agreement to allow uh, wallets to be parameterized according to those criteria. So those are just some initial thoughts to get the conversation started. Wow. I'm, I'm happy to jump in and, and build on that a little bit. 
yes. I, I agree very much with what Tomas was saying. I think that when, when I think about some of the legacy systems that we're talking about and um, the architecture patterns that we had at our disposal when those systems were built, they were very different than the architecture patterns that we have today, right? This is pre-cloud, pre, uh, you know, high speed internet, you know, today we can incorporate just what we know about architecture, for example, modular design. So designing systems in a way that are loosely coupled so that if you need to change one component, all you have to do is slide out a brick and put in a new brick. And this is very much what, what Tomas was talking about is parameterizing these things and understanding um, what parameters we need and how to build a system that's loosely coupled such that we can evolve it with evolving policy considerations that we still can't anticipate. I like to think about these systems like it's a new, like it's we're introducing an iPhone. It's gonna be very, very hard to anticipate what type of innovation is going to be spurred on top of this platform in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, but, but from a practical sense as well, you know, when we think about these parameters and we think about generalizing, almost by definition, in order to generalize, you need to have a couple of examples to generalize from. And I think that that's what we're seeing today. As these things move less out of the laboratory and into practical pilots with real value put on ledger and these type of transactions, we're gonna start finding these pa patterns and be able to generalize and parameterize very, very quickly. So that, that's what I'm looking forward to in, in like the next scope of the next year's work. Great. Uh, I think Saul is going to take over now. Well, you know, this mm. is really fascinating. And it makes me wonder uh, to what extent there is a precondition to uh, being able to parameterize, right? And kind of to, um, as Tomas said, ideally have an agreement on which parameters uh, are more important for this interoperability. Because you know, there is a norm, there has to be a normative agreement on certain goals on certain good things and bad things. What is it that we're trying to control or promote uh, and whatnot? In other words, there has to be a standardization of substantive regulatory and, and legal requirements and approaches. And to me, that's the governance issue that's uh, incredibly complicated. And then we are in the chicken and egg kind of situation, you know, which comes first? the ability to parameterize, you know, create these parameters that are interoperable through technology, or all of us agreeing, or a lot of jurisdictions agreeing on what constitutes bad behavior, for example. What is terrorism? What is, you know, not terrorism, for mm -hmm. example? Those are incredibly thorny issues. And as, as a lawyer, I just wanted to kind of highlight that, uh, that aspect. Yes. Um... This, you know, it's pointed to the criticism of the FATF uh, work. I mean, that everybody tries to implement the KYC, AML, uh, TDD uh, work, uh, I mean, recommendations. Uh, so in a sense, there is a systemic view that is needed which, which is what uh, in the end comes through. And the other thing that is not even talked about is under what conditions are you going to upgrade? Daniel mentioned that some legacy systems uh, exist in the past, but we know that new things are going to happen. New technology is going to come through, new problems are going to come through. So where the intersection of those two things happen, how do we, um, upgrade either the CBDCs in the world or the rails that connect them. But uh, I think I have to give uh, some uh, time to the questions that are coming up in the chat. Uh, one of them is, uh, of course, addressed to you, Daniel, I think uh, in a certain sense is the liquidity provision and the replacement of the uh, correspondent banking system will still need somebody to provide, uh, you know, some kind of a price, some kind of a exchange rate. 
Uh, in the case of Project Abair, for example, that rate is constant because they belong to a currency union of some sort. They have definite, uh, uh, you know, sort of exchange rates between the currencies, and that's what they hinge on. But uh, Daniel, could you uh, talk about the difficulties you had in this regard? Yeah, ha happily, I, I I agree with the premise of the question that you know. Uh, constraints around liquidity and, and effects um, in general are still going to remain, right? You can, you can provide general, but, they, but it's also a very nuanced question because there's an assumption here around access to central bank balance sheets that creates the notion of and the necessity for Nostra Vostra accounts and some of, some of the mechanisms that we have today. So, so there's a lot of assumptions in the question that um, access to central bank balance sheets will remain as they are. And therefore, how would you, you know, provide liquidity and maybe um, otherwise unliquid markets? Uh, and th and that's a that's a very fair point. That's that's not a uh, a, a technical um, th that's not that's not a technical challenge. That's a that's a usability challenge, um, and that's depth of markets and some of the things that Tommaso was mentioning uh, as well. So so that, that's a very very good point. The question maybe is, you know, if some of this technology was available. Would maybe otherwise markets that are less liquid have more liquidity because of uh, market behavior, and, and I think that that's um, something that's still to to be determined. Um, but but it, it's a it's a it's a nuanced point. I, I would also suggest that maybe uh, you know th there's always the option that as a consequence of some of the access of the technology, maybe access to central bank balance sheets will change. Um, you know, a, a good example is when you talk to the uh, the Swiss central bank. Uh, for them, the notion of offshore banks holding accounts at the Swiss Central Bank is is a natural idea, right? And that's existed there for a long time. Whereas you go to other jurisdictions, and that seems like uh, an absolute impossibility. So it, it, it's very jurisdictional specific. So it's hard to answer the question. But these goalposts are are moving uh, together with the technology. The other one of the other questions that came up, which uh, uh, Tom also may be able to answer, is: uh, Are there already such groupings uh, forming around the world where there are? Uh, since you are part of an intergovernmental organization, uh, you might have more clarity on that. Whether these groupings of um, central banks that are cooperating. Where, where, you know, Saule talked about the fact that we start off with these little circles and then probably go into a bigger circle. But right now, what is the situation with respect to that? Thanks, Vivian. Um, I'm not too concerned about the situation now. I mean, you do see uh, groupings, but it's, it's uh, well, certainly you have groupings uh, such as those that uh, Daniel mentioned, but that's very much for experimental uh, reasons yes. and, and that's great that they're small that they start small exactly how it should be um, i think that you know the bas innovation hub is doing an incredible uh, job uh, and adding a lot of value to to offering this uh, public good internationally um no my concern was more uh, looking forward it was more you know given yeah. that there will yeah. be ways in which to establish uh, very efficient links among countries at low cost uh, it may be the case that for whatever reason, whether it's pure political uh, or other, uh, that groups of countries decide to uh, work uh, closely with each other, but exclude other groups. And then, and then we start to have a much more fragmented payment system, uh, which has implications, it's not just you know, payments, but it has implications for trade, it has implications for development of financial markets, the ability to hedge risks across countries, the distribution, the, the, uh, the uh, propagation of shocks, etc. Um, we've, we've done everything we could uh, to try to avoid a fragmented world. And it starts with a payment system, which is very much the basis of a lot of economic transactions. And so our hope is that this will not uh, materialize in the future. But uh, uh, one of the points that should be made is uh, these, some of these groupings are natural in the sense that uh, they are between countries uh, that are either uh, have similar philosophies like a G20 or 
between countries that geo you know geographically closer together and they have a lot of trade between them all of that is uh, possible so it could be a natural evolution and an organic thing uh, david you have to you have something to offer on this uh, with one more uh, question uh, i'm going to go to the closing remarks because we have uh, you know just about 5 minutes i probably need 3 minutes to do it but I think after David Saulet can go ahead and talk about that for, for a bit, for a minute minute or so. Sure. Uh, I mean, maybe I'll just say very, very quickly, um, you know, my, my view is a lot of the, again, a lot of the focus for standardization, um, you know, in, in pockets of, of unions around, around the globe, I think are, are generally focused primarily on payments and payments infrastructure. Um, again, thinking about central bank digital currencies more broadly, uh, I, think, I think there's still a lot of domestic uh, focus and jurisdictional focus that uh, you know, should, should last um, for qu quite some time. Saula, you have? Yeah, I just wanted to echo what everybody said. And um, I think there is a need for more creative and maybe bolder thinking about the institutional arrangements on the international level. Uh, and um, I'll just leave it at that. One of the things we have to mention is this is the last session of the DCGI uh, uh, conference, the DC3 conference uh, tomorrow to, uh, uh, for today. Tomorrow the sessions continue, and so so do the sessions continue on uh, the day after tomorrow. Tomorrow's sessions will be focused on um, stable coins, and the last session will be focused on uh, the last day will be focused on security, which we haven't even opened up in this uh, session because interoperability of course, has to take into account all of these different uh, topics. But in the last three minutes uh, that we have, uh, let me first uh, thank everyone who showed up, uh, all the people who presented. And of course, you know, without the presenters and the audience, uh, there is no conference. Um, so we opened with Tommaso who, magisterially defined, uh, you know, the whole monetary policy uh, uh, landscape and the mindful and the minefields that are waiting for us in all of them. Uh, and they are uh, similar to what they, what they are today, but they could be amplified. Um, they could uh, become much more dire and happen in a much faster fashion. So, uh, if you have interoperability that is faster, more efficient, less costly, and so on. Essentially, it is about the losing of sovereign boundaries. And we know where that has led us uh, today uh, uh, into a contraction into our own shells, into our own uh, selves a little bit because of the pandemic, uh, which was uh, supposed to be caused by this. The um, other participants echoed these themes. And of course, uh, we went through a cycle. That is, uh, you had the broad thoughts, and then you had Daniel talking about actual technology. Then you had Sole talking about the fourth layer, which was missing, uh, the regulatory layer, uh, and then also about the coalesc coalescence of the circles into the big circle and what that would mean in terms of a counterparty of last resort, which uh, uh, the central banks have been for a long time. The last uh, person, that, uh, David, also went deeper into the actual um, technology aspect. But through all this, we see how technology and policy are interrelated. And I would say that we need a way to have a conversation in terms of having technical standards that can implement, that is capability to implement 
policy, monetary policy, regulation, and all the other things that go with it. Thank you for attending and please, um, um, please participate in the interoperability report that we are preparing. Uh, thank you again. And uh, I think uh, my time is now up and Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.